Welcome to Accenture's Insurance News Analysis. I'm Abby Compton here with Kenneth Saldana, Accenture's Global Lead for Insurance. We'll be talking about what's making news around the industry. There was a lot to say about coal at Davos. Uh, insurance CEOs in particular are talking about the need both to divest from coal and to draw down coal-related underwriting in order to meet net zero targets and to keep premiums from rising with global temperatures. Kenneth, how do you see insurers navigating the difficult choices ahead? Abby, I think the, the insurers first and foremost have no choice but to navigate this because they're going to get the demands from their customers, from their activist shareholders, and from governments. And I think there's going to be um, external, if not internal, pressure to respond and take the stand that's required on all of these issues. Um, I think we're going to see a series of, of steps towards this. Uh, I think the divestment probably first, and that it is an investment portfolio decision that can be taken easy, more easily than changing risk models and changing products and changing underwriting behaviors towards newer products. Not only is it the case that there is a long actuarial history and understanding of these fossil fuel companies, there really isn't as much of that lost history or experience or knowledge around what the new uh, sustainable energy sources are going to be. So that does represent a substantial move for the industry to actually change its product set, change its underwriting and actuarial behaviors to match that. So I think there will be action. I think there will be action in a series of steps. And my sense is that we're going to see the divestment side before we see the change in product and underwriting. Well, increasing global temperatures are also linked to increases in heat-related illness and deaths. We've talked before about how this exacerbates risk across the spectrum of insurance, life insurance, workers' comp, disability, et cetera. But we now see community-based organizations collecting more data uh, to identify dangerous hotspots. And are these the kinds of public-private partnerships insurers might tap into to help mitigate the heat-related risk? Again, I think, uh, Abby, I think insurers are going to use every means possible to actually respond to these changes. Um, the fact is all of the loss prediction models have actually been upended by global warming. Um, you know, the industry used to talk about attritional losses and catastrophic losses, and they still do. But the fact is that that line has blurred very substantially. Um, you just see so many more of these extreme weather-related incidents that are playing out across the board. And at the same time, we've seen not only physical health, but mental health claims and losses really spike, particularly with all the isolation of COVID in the last two years. And so you see this real shift in what experience insurers are having for what used to be the same book of business. And we just talked about on the fossil fuel to sustainable fuel, that's a big shift of underwriting, under, underlying risk and product. There actually isn't a change in product uh, for things like you know fire and extreme heat uh, or disability, but we're seeing a completely different risk profile. So um, I think there's certainly the uh, all of the organizations, local organizations are stepping into this to create this visibility. It's also the place where we see a lot of focus when it comes to data and you know, modeling some of this with AI to try to find these patterns that are not around on the long, long trend of actuarial tables. So um, I think these communities will be a part of that. I think it'll be a, a core part of what we see uh, in the data analysis and the AI ML efforts to actually understand how to deal with these new loss patterns. So you blogged last month about the three levels of insurance industry data analytics. Uh, we now see results from a survey of European insurers showing 80% of those who use predictive analytics, the most advanced level, with positive business impacts to both top and bottom line. However, many say that they struggle with in-house facilities stretched by these large volumes of data. What do you see insurers needing to do in order to really get their data flowing? So I think data quality and data architecture have bec have been recognized now in insurance and I think everywhere as the you know the ongoing fuel for any of these changes. So I think the notion of having a digital core doesn't really work unless you have the data quality 
um, to actually act on that. So I think what we're seeing with insurers is a recognition that you know the the in-house resources just aren't going to be enough. And what used to be, we will look outside for data enrichment. So essentially look for external data sources is becoming, I think, a broader recognition that working with the data ecosystem, whether it's for sourcing data, analyzing data, any of that is actually much more in the cards right now. You, you add to that, Abby, the, the incredible crunch we're seeing on talent, and it's almost impossible for any organization, and certainly for any insurers, to actually field and run the kind of talent to, to do the data analytics that they'd like to do uh, in order to match what's being asked for in market. So um, I, I think we are going to see absolutely um, the notion of the data ecosystem expanding from not just data sourcing, but the actual analytics and the curating and the creation of, of the ability to use this data effectively in the, in the market. We've talked about the risks of customers wearing VR headsets and accidentally damaging their own property. Yes. Now we're seeing ways VR can help drivers test their abilities uh, and understand the damaging costs that may result from simulated accidents. Do you see these kinds of VR re virtual reality customer experiences improving the real life reality of insurance underwriting? Um, I, I think it absolutely will, Abby. And I think when we look at, um, you know, to be fair, simulations and learning from simulations are not new. Whether we talk about, you know, when we talk about the insurance industry um, participating in education for teen drivers by creating um, simulations of drunk driving, right? These are the um, vehicles that were built with slightly uh, delayed responses into their into their uh, steering or the brakes or the or at the time clutch and accelerator right so this this notion of simulating uh, and learning through a simulation has been well established it used to be mechanical and now it's moving into the virtual uh, so when we talk about the metaverse continuum you know, one of the very first use cases for most insurers is around training and this is going to be one of them used to be that insurers would have buildings that they would set on fire and then have their claims adjusters learn about what was happening. It's a lot easier to do that virtually, a lot cheaper to do that virtually, and have them not only walk through burnt out buildings, but flooded basements and, and leaking faucets and leaking mains, etc. So um, I think we will see a lot of activity on the training side of this. And when it comes to um, what's happening with underwriting, Certainly, on the on the one hand, there'll be just underwriting to understand risk profiles of a factory or a, an office building um, or a home, right? So commercial or personal. I think we will see underwriters learning in those environments. Um, I think the not so much the virtual, but the but the data that surrounds creating those simulations will also be used on the underwriting side. So you know, when we think about the metaverse continuum for insurance, I think we probably see a start with with training, uh, including training for underwriters. But I think uh, it, it will expand into you know what that metaverse enables in, in terms of its underlying data as well. According to new research out of the UK, 42% of pension schemes say they lack access to specialist skills to investigate cybercrime incidents, and 43% say they haven't tested the strength of their IT systems, processes, and procedures for cybercrime protection. Uh, Kenneth, is the struggle to achieve operational resilience in the face of cybersecurity threats, uh, rising cybersecurity threats, really a universal challenge, or is it more acute in certain markets or lines of business? I mean, I'm sure there there are pockets for of where this is acute, but the thing that that is real about cyber and the risk from cyber is that it's a never ending escalation, right? And so, for every uh, effort that is put in place for resilience, there's someone out there finding the malicious software to get around that latest uh, data security, right? And so. Uh, this is absolutely going to be an eternal vigilance space because you do have uh, bad actors responding to everything that that an organization does or what or the industry does to actually maintain safety here. Now, um, that's just the state of play for the entire industry. Um, that is absolutely going to be compounded in pockets where people don't keep up with what's happening, right? And uh, I think we see that literally on the entire spectrum from 
you know, the unfortunate reality is still an enormous number of household, you know, routers on which we're doing a lot of work these days being run with standard admin passwords. That's the personal line side of, you know, not being up to date with what's going on all the way to the, you know, the, the commercial side and the specialty side of cyber. So I think, unfortunately, we're going to have um, sort of this eternal vigilance game. And I think that will, that's going to be exacerbated for those who actually don't keep up. Well, Kenneth, thank you again for joining me for this month's insurance news analysis. Always great to talk to you and hear your perspective on the industry. Nice to talk to you, Abby. Take care.